Good evening. As our participants join, I would like to welcome you to the Issues That Matter, Surviving Online and Hybrid Schooling. This event is brought to you by Snow Owl Libraries and supported by the Snow Owl Libraries Foundation. We are so pleased that you are taking the time to join us here this Thursday evening. The situation that has created the need for social distance and coming together here online instead of in person has also given us the topic for this year's Issues That Matter series, Pandemic Pressures, Supporting Community and Family Mental Health. As a parent, I think I share the feeling of having been on the longest roller coaster ride imagined since our schools closed almost a year ago. What have we learned about remote and hybrid schooling as our students have gone back to school? How have these changes affected our kids? What can we do to focus on the positives and successes and make the right decisions for our youth? Our panelists this evening will answer these questions and as many of yours as they can. During this presentation, your microphones are muted and you can enter your questions and comments into chat at any time. They will be visible to only the panelists and Snow Owl Library staff, Gabriel and Ensign, who will collect the questions for the Q&A part of the event at the end. We understand this topic can be very personal and we will do our best to ensure that your questions are anonymous. If your question is for a specific panelist, please let us know. Gabriel and Ensign will be also sharing links to resources and library information in chat throughout the event. This evening's program will be recorded for later viewing and will be available on the Snow Isle Library's YouTube channel as soon as possible. And a big thank you to our panelists for taking the time to be here this evening. This event could not have happened without each of you. Please welcome Rachel Hyde Prieto, counselor at Meadowvale Middle School in Linwood. Nidhi Oberoi, School and Program Director at Whole Earth Montessori in Bothell, and Deb Sherbin, teacher at Coopville Elementary School on Woodby Island. And our speakers are each going to tell us a little bit about themselves and what brings them here this evening. And then we'll have some questions for them. Rachel, I will let you start, please. Okay, thank you. Um, well, welcome this evening. Thanks for coming. Um, uh, my name is Rachel Hyde Prieto. I'm a school counselor in the Edmonds School District at uh, Meadowdale Middle School currently. I've been a school counselor in middle school for 22 years, and that might make me a little crazy, but uh, it's a fun, fun age. And I love, I just love the energy of the middle school age student. Um, I've also worked in the Clover Park School District south of Tacoma with uh, military families at Joint Base Lewis McCord and have had some experience there uh, with kids and who's have families deployed and, and things like that and stressors like that. So um, uh, the um, age group that I work with, they are just, they're slowly turning into young adults, um, yet they have so many characteristics of young kids still. Um, they're uh, at the same time trying to individuate from their family and become their own little individuals but uh yet sometimes they'll, they'll push you away and no no get away but other times they're still clinging to you like i still need your mom and dad or <laughs> you know so they do this push pull thing and um it's very interesting because you will see uh, i was reading a children's book uh, or not children a book about um raising toddlers and recently and so many of the things they referenced in that book talk about how what we see um, between um, birth and age five you often see repeated again in early adolescence um, and so uh, it, it was very interesting um, that particular book and I, just in case anybody wants to uh, you know wants to read that book it's called uh, how toddlers thrive by Tova P. Klein, um, and it's, it's pretty neat. It's pretty neat read, even though it's not for the upper grade levels so much, it has a lot of things that relate. So, um, so my perspective on online schooling, it has been, it has been a wild ride. Um, it has certainly churned my profession differently, um, but how to cope in online schooling, how to manage it, especially working parents. Um, I have a kindergartner and I'm trying to be in classrooms and teach my lessons that I do and, and manage her online. It is very, very difficult. And so uh, we thank all of you parents out there who are doing that double duty right now. Um, there is no harder job in this world than being a parent. Um, and so some of the things that 
I see uh, as far as coping with this online schooling and how to help your student and help yourself is um, listening to kids is a big one. When kids come to talk to me, it's often um, they go, they just talk and talk and talk because they, kids are used to being talked at a lot. You know, they don't often get the opportunity to be heard as much. And so just let your kid talk to you um, and validate their feelings, whether or not you agree with them, you can still say, you know, I really, I understand what you're saying. Um, I'm sorry you feel that way or um, just validating them can make a big difference in how they're feeling. Um, staying calm, of course, that's hard to do when we're in the heat of the moment, something going on. Because um, you parents, of course, are role models for their kids. And they take their cues from you. I know when I worked with military families, um, and one of the parents was just deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan, um, the remaining parent who was at home, if they weren't handling the situation very well, usually the students weren't handling it well either. Um, and so you kind of, kind of the trickle down effect. So um, getting help for yourself and finding people that you can talk to who you, will listen to you as well is super important. Um, limiting screen time and exposure, that's a super hard one to do right now because obviously they're online for school, right? And the, sometimes the only social opportunities kids have is being online, playing um, and so, you know, if you have to bend the rules a little bit for that to let them have that extra social time, then I would absolutely say to do that to help them so that they have that social connection piece if they can't get it in any other way. But I would also say, make sure you're still keeping boundaries and setting boundaries because the natural reaction when kids are, when we see our kids hurting is to want to um, make it all better and do what we can for them to, you know, take whatever hurt away. And so we'll start letting later bedtimes or um, doing extra special treats or uh, just bending the rules for other things. And so um, having boundaries and rules does actually say you care. It creates a sense of safety. Um, and you having routines, especially too, can create a sense of safety as well, a sense of normalcy, which is something that, um, kids need to feel right now because things aren't normal. Um, most kids don't know what it's like to, uh, or, you know, my kid is a kindergartner. She never knew what regular school was like, really. So this is kind of normal for her, unfortunately, but for all of our other kids, it's not. And um, they're so desperate to have any kind of connection right now. They'll do anything. Um, so creating that sense of normalcy, <laughs> making sure that they're getting sleep at night. Our, my middle schoolers where I teach, we, we will see them often. We can see when they're logging onto their computers or not, and they're up at two, three o'clock in the morning. And then they can't stay awake the next day during some of their morning Zoom classes. And so making sure you have set bedtimes, if you can get the technology out of the room, have a place you know, where you can store it out in the, the main living room or somewhere where you know they won't get onto it later in the evening or be tempted to um, and keep themselves awake. Because obviously, whenever we're tired, we have less patience less ability to have empathy for other people, and just to cope with any unexpected things that come up. Um, let's see, uh, getting exercise, of course, is another great way of coping, finding things to get outside. Um, go ride bikes if you can, find whatever socially distanced activities you feel are safe for your family, and get out there and do them. Um, uh, let's see, and just there are a lot of, um, I know, apps that are free that help um, with like mindfulness or relaxation. Um, and you can go on and they'll lead uh, kids through guided meditations or relaxations. Um, if you want to know about what other kind of online social clubs or activities are going on, I would really recommend for you to contact uh, your school counselor or look on your school's websites and see if they're having any social activities after the regular day. Yes, it probably will be on Zoom, unfortunately, but, um, but I find that kids are just logging on to engage um, even in a study hall when all their homework's done. They just want to be around someone else. And so, um, so yeah, that's kind of some things to cope. Um, 
and help yourself and help your student. So I'm going to hand it over to Needy Oberoi. She is um, in Bothell and she's with Whole Earth Montessori. Thank you, Rachel. I appreciate it. Um, thank you, everybody. I'd like to thank Krista for letting me be a part of this webinar. Um, when it comes to kids, uh, they're my passion. And that's the reason I've been working as, in a school for the last 19 years now. Um, it's called Holder Montessori in Bothell. And um, I'm very grateful that I got to be a part of that school and I still am. And I've been a teacher and I'm the school director at the same school. This topic, the surviving online, I can talk to hybrid because we haven't done that. We, we, are, we are in person for some classes and we are online for our elementary part that goes up to sixth grade. And uh, yeah, it, you know, life kind of turned upside down last year, starting in March for everybody. And uh, taking a step back in March as a director, as a teacher, as a parent, as a human being, you know, all of us kind of had to figure out how to help ourselves first. So we could also help the younger who are dependent on us. And you know, I always tell my teachers, our cups need to be full so we can be able to take care of everybody else around us. So you know, I start by saying to every single parent who's watching this, take care of yourselves. That's important because if you can take care of yourselves, you can take care of people, the younger ones who are dependent on you. A lot of what I saw last year and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's been hard. It's been hard as a parent and it's also been hard running a school because parents look up to us for answers. And for COVID, we, we don't have any answers. This is unprecedented. We've never seen something like that, ever experienced anything like this. We really didn't have any answers. But what we have answers for is how to help your child through this time. And I agree 100% with Rachel when she said, you know, listen to them. That's what we tell our parents, be there for your child. It's not about academics now. It's about being present for your child. It's about hearing them. It's about being able to sit down, giving them the time when they're trying to talk to you about their frustrations or their anger or just their sadness of not being around their peers. And that's hard because I see it, I see the elementary kids, you know, they, when they're online in our school, they're always talking about when do I get to be back in the classroom? And that's so hard because we can't answer that right now, but they all want to be back in person. And it's, it's such an important part of our life, social connection. And I think this topic again is so important because everybody's feeling isolated. Everybody's feeling that sense of loss. There's a sense of, you know, we are all grieving in some ways because things that we knew we don't have anymore. So it's, it, there's grieving, there's loss, there's sort of accepting what is now normal and for how long nobody knows. And helping ki kids deal with these issues, giving them the right tools to be emotionally resilient, to be emotionally strong, to, to adapt, that's kind of the key right now. And I always tell my parents in my school, it's really about being there for your child. And I think that's what's important as a parent and as any adult right now is just to be the support structure for your students, for your family, for your kids and for everybody around you, just being together as a community. And I think this uh, webinar is I think a good opportunity because everybody kind of comes in with a different perspective. And it's great to get all these amazing ideas. And at the end of the day, the goal is the same. It's all about the kids in our lives, whether as parents or whether as teachers or whether as even neighbors or family or friends, it's all about the students. So thank you. And I'll pass it over to Deb. Thank you, Nitty. Thank you, Rachel. And again, I want to thank the Snow Isle Library. Uh, what a wonderful program. Um, you know, I, it's hard to believe that this happened a year ago, totally not an ideal situation, but really the only thing we could do, um, you know, best option we had to keep kids and families safe. Um, really, uh, I agree so much with what both of you said. Um, I, I think the biggest thing for me, the hardest thing for me is um, I love my job and I have a, a dynamic classroom. <laughs> it's engaging and, uh, you know, just, how am I going to recreate that on a screen? And last year was hard. It was so hard. Uh, it, 
you know, I mean, I think there were a lot of us that just thought, can we keep doing this? And honestly, what kept me going were the kids. They just, they were amazing. My goodness, the grit that these kids are showing. Um, I teach fifth grade and um, I'm kind of in a unique situation. I have a son that's a high school teacher and two daughters-in-law, they're elementary school teachers who teach in different districts. So I've been able to see it from many different perspectives. And I think most teachers feel the same way. They want so badly to be in the classroom and we want so badly to recreate what we've been doing. I think when, when this all happened, um, the biggest thing for me was how do I communicate with my parents? And we came up with, the, with a, you know, a way that school-wide we communicate. It's called the Remind Program. And I think the one thing I'd really wanna make sure that, that parents know is please communicate with your kids' teachers. Um, let us know what's going on because we know it's hard. We know how hard, I mean, many of us are parents my children are all grown, but, but many of us um, are parents and we know exactly what you're going through and um, we sympathize with that. So make sure that you're communicating with your kid's teacher. I think that's so important. Um, you know, the other thing, I, I'm, I'm one of those teachers as a former early childhood educator and now being where I'm at, um, I have a, a couple really strong philosophies. One of them is we need to play. Kids at an early age need to learn through play. How do you do that on a screen? I've seen amazing things from our kindergarten and first grade and our primary teachers. And I have a, a, a kindergarten, at least first grade now, but a, um, a grandson that was in first grade last year, I was amazed with what his teacher was able to do. Um, I'm a huge proponent of less screen time. And here we are asking kids to be on the screen more. And so that was really hard. So um, I think one thing that a lot of us are doing as teachers is to figure out how can we do a healthy balance of screen time and non-screen time, you know, with our kids. And, um, you know, so that's something that we're trying to do. But I know that I've just really tried to keep my same classroom routines going. And um, I mean, I think one of the coolest things has been I get to meet the parents more through this. Um, you know, we get to see the parents. The parents are sometimes in the screen asking questions. And, and um, but um, I really agreed with, um, I think it was Rachel that said, you've got to have boundaries, routines. That's really important. I'm seeing a lot of kids laying in bed for class um, in their pajamas. Um, I'm, I'm very blunt, you know, get out of bed, get your clothes on, get up, have a space where, where, you know, real school. This isn't fake school. And, you know, so setting those boundaries, going to bed early, that's been one thing a lot of parents have said, I can't get my kid to go to bed early. I can't get my kid to get off the, the Chromebook. So I think as parents, it's really important we put the Chromebooks away. Um, we have set bedtimes. Um, maybe Friday field trips. Um, I'm in a unique position here because we, I was online all the way until last week. And my students came back on Monday. So I have half the kids on both sides. Um, and oh my gosh, the kids are so excited to be back. It's, I just, uh, it, it's just heartwarming. But um, I think setting those routines. And the one thing I've seen um, with several families that's really worked is uh, little field trips, little Friday field trips, um, little things that you can do as a family going on a walk um, exploring, you know, doing things that, that get you away from that screen. Um, I feel like I'm rambling here, but, um, anyway, I think a lot, of I think Rachel and Nitty kind of really, you know, hit what, um, what I feel, um, in my answers, I collaborated a lot with, um, my colleagues here at school from preschool through fifth grade to share some different perspectives, but, um, so hopefully I'll be able to answer those in the, in the question and answer. But thanks for coming, you know, and thanks, Snowell, for offering this offering this opportunity. Well, thank you all for sharing a little bit about yourselves um, and background and your experience. I love that. Um, the question that comes to the top as I listen to you, um, I think probably on the minds of a lot of parents um, with us this evening is what are you seeing in students that are really navigating this well. Um, Deb, you mentioned grit, and I'd like to hear more about that from each of you. What, what are you seeing in those students that are really doing well? 
Um, I can start um, if that's okay. Um, I mean, clearly we're seeing um, good and bad, more good. Um, I think the ones that are doing well, they, they're treating this like real school. They're coming to their meets um, every day. Um, their, their Chromebooks are, are, um, are charged. Um, they have a clear workspace set up at home. They're getting a good night's sleep. Um, they seem excited to be there, but I think it's the routine. You know, that they're, they're in a routine. They know this is school. And so that's what, for the, for the students who are really making this work, the families that are making that work, I think it is, you know, just setting that. I would say I, for, oh, yeah. go ahead. If you want to go needy. That's okay. No worries. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so I would say, you know, pretty much the same for middle school. Um, the not procrastinating. We're seeing kids that that go to the office hours with the teachers in the afternoon, and they use that structured as a structured time to complete their homework. Even if they're not there to ask questions, they'll just, you know, turn their screen off and work on their schoolwork. And then if they have a question, they pop in. Sometimes they'll go there to do work with a friend, and so they can have a little conversation while they're working together. So they have a sense of of that socialization somewhat. Um, and they what this pandemic has forced in the online learning for uh, middle schoolers is they are now having to manage their time more for themselves in the classroom teachers have always managed it for them um, and and so now they are learning a skill if we want to reframe this pandemic into something <laughs> for something positive that might come mm -hmm. out of it is a lot of them are hopefully learning that skill of learning to manage some of their time and prioritize their tasks for themselves, which will benefit them greatly in high school and beyond. Um, if they learn, if they're able to get that skill down, many are struggling with it, but um, learning how to delay gratification for playing their video games instead of doing their homework, you know, a lot of it's like like she said, having our own set up workspace and getting to sleep regularly and having the routine and eating healthy and, and then scheduling fun time, you know, having, having that planned, having that planned fun time to look forward to um, big is a really big thing. So. So for the students who are not, you know, who are kind of navigating through this in a positive way I we're seeing and again you know I, I I talk to all my teachers before this I talk to the preschool teachers my first to third grade and all the way up to sixth grade to kind of get their perspective because they're in the classrooms every day and so the kids were doing well they're shining you know they're they're excited to be on their own time they have their workspace and they're all ready to go it's like school so they're built up a lot of self-esteem too which is great and they're the ones who are kind of trying to move out of their comfort zone. They want to do more. They want to do different activities online. They're always asking the teachers, what can we do? And what we're also seeing is a lot of compassion and empathy happening because these kids are helping the ones who are struggling in their classroom. And they're able to say, you know, within Zoom, they're saying, hey, you know, I'd love to help you. Do you want to go in a breakout room? And they'll ask the teacher and they're helping each other, which is kind of really nice to see that they understand that, yes, you know, we're, we're so comfortable with it, we can help somebody else with this. And I think that's fantastic. Interestingly, are the quiet ones in class, like in person, and they're really shining online. It's very fascinating. Thank you. I, I think you've kind of touched on this. I, I want to ask, what surprise successes have you seen in these different models that you would like to continue as we, um, I don't want to say go back to traditional learning models because maybe things have forever changed, but, but education, you know, things are slow to change. So what are some things you would like to hold on to as we move forward? I think for, for what I've seen, the accessibility of materials now to students and families. Um, in the past, a lot of teachers who were a little more shy about using technology, um, it was paper, a lot of paper being handed out and things. Um, and now they know how to make it accessible to the kids online. So they, they don't have to always go ask the teacher for what they need. They know where to get it now. And, and it's there for parents to access. It's easier, I think, for now. I think we may hold more um, Zoom meetings for meetings with parents um, because 
easier to get you in to have a meeting so you don't have to leave work. You can do it on a half an hour lunch break or, you know, you don't have to rush home from uh, 45 minutes away to try and make a meeting with your child's parent or your child's teacher or something um, when, when that happens. So there might be more easier accessibility with being able to have that working partnership with your school. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's a, a good benefit out of this. So for our school, one of the very surprising things that happened for our fourth, fifth, and sixth grade is that their teacher um, started asking them what would bring them joy in the classroom other than just the classwork that they were doing or the lessons that they were getting. So a couple of kids suggested that they wanted to read a favorite poem online. And it's become this big thing in their classroom. And every single day, the morning starts off by one student, one student picking up a fa favorite poem and reciting it to the kids. And then they end up doing these impromptu discussions about the poem and they're loving it. And now what's happened after a year is that all of these students, instead of just finding a book of poetry, they're trying to come up with their own poetry now. And they're, they're, so they're spending the weekend writing down you know, what they're feeling or what they've seen and they're creating this amazing poetry. And so every day, that's what's happening in the upper elementary classroom is it, the day starts with poetry, whether it's been written by somebody else or by the students. So that's amazing. And then the other thing, as Rachel said, we started our, we, we, our Fridays are half days. So we have teacher office hours online. And the parents are loving it because if they have a concern, they have a question, you know, they can just set up an appointment that we have two hours, so, like we have two hours on every Friday for teachers. So they get 15, 20 minute slots and the parents are signing up. So the teachers are more connected with parents almost on a weekly basis, especially for kids, you know, who need that support from the parents and from the teachers. So it's been fantastic. And the third thing, virtual tours, you know, we've always taken our elementary kids to the aquarium. They've gone to the zoo. But because of COVID, you know, they've been in the classrooms, I mean, at home, but they're doing virtual tours of NASA, you know, the National Museum of History, MoMA. And so, the, you know, suddenly like all this, it's, it's widened, the world's kind of become bigger in some ways. So they're doing weekly virtual tours and they're loving it. And I think we will continue that once we get back in person. We've been doing the same thing with virtual tours and bringing in um, guest speakers. It's very easy to bring guest speakers in now. <laughs> which has been really fascinating. Um, now we have a, um, an online hub that is the, student, the student's daily planner and it's really slick because, and if students, we have some students that prefer the paper planner, but now they've got this hub, it has all their links on it and all their assignments. And um, it's, it's just been wonderful. Um, oh, more parent involvement. I'm, I get to see parents more. Um, book clubs. I've been able, I, I think um, one of you was talking about the small groups. It's, it's been easier to meet with small groups um, because we can bring them together. I've got a high cap um, reading club and then I have reading clubs with other, with other groups and uh, we have, we're able to meet with kids at, you know, kids that need interventions. We're able to meet in small groups on our Friday um, office hours. And I think that's something that we'll keep doing. Um, because we can, especially now that we're in hybrid and we'll, we still have the Fridays, I'll now be able to meet with kids. Um, you know, they don't have to be six feet apart. We're right on the screen. So um, just a lot of things that we've done that um, I think we'll be able to continue to do that, that, have, been, that have been successful. Thank you. And to recognize that it's not all sunshine. And some things have been really difficult and hard. And um, I think a lot of us, if we're parents listening and even the teachers are concerned about changes in behavior as a result of online or um, not having the, the traditional model of learning, what are some changes in behavior that you've seen that we should be watching out for um, and, and be aware of? So I'll start with the little ones because I think sometimes you forget about the really like the preschoolers that we have online. And um, I think one thing I do want to say is to parents is since we're all of us are staying in one home all the time right now under one roof, be very mindful of your conversations as adults because kids have very big ears. 
and they hear and they have absorbent mind, especially the age of two to six, they take everything in like sponges and whether they understand it or not. So being very careful of what's being spoken or the news that you're watching at home, because I know there's some students that we have online and actually who started in person too. There's a four-year-old who said to me that, oh, Miss Nidhi, I can't take my mask off and I can't go anywhere because the virus will get me and I'll be dead. And that's a four-year-old saying that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, you're, you know, you, you cringe when you hear a four-year-old say that because it's gone bad and it's going to get me. So being very mindful of what's being said around the kids, I think that's something we all have to watch out for. A lot of our kids, you know, it's that, especially the elementary ones, you know, it's that, that body language you see starting to sleep, it's the shoulders go down, they're slouching and like, I don't really care. It's not really going anywhere. I'm alone and I don't want to be with my parents. And it's that sense of unhappiness in a lot of kids also that you're seeing. Zoom fatigue, another one, the kids are sick and tired, some of them, of constantly being on the computer with their students and teachers. You know, it's different when you're playing a game. But to be in class all day long, it's exhausting, especially for the little ones. It's really hard. So th those are some of the things that we've seen and that sense of isolation, you know, being by yourself. It's just hard because that's, you know, no man's a island. Everybody needs those connections and you can give them virtually. But the negative side is, yes, that they are feeling that isolation, that there's nobody and nobody cares. And what's the point? Really, it kind of boils down to that. So. There are, um, you know, for abnormal times, it, it is normal to feel depressed and anxious. It is normal for there to feel the grief and the loss and the anger and, and difficulty with focus, irritated easily. That's, that is normal. It becomes um, kind of concerning when it's a constant feeling, when you don't ever see them come out of those feelings. Like there, there should be times in the day when they, when they are experiencing some joy or they're not having those feelings. It's when it's constant that there needs to be some concern and look for maybe some extra help. Um, feelings of hopelessness, like there isn't any future for them. That's a concern when they start talking like there isn't a future. Um, difficulty doing just daily tasks like functioning, like um, sleeping or eating or um, uh, hygiene. That's <laughs> a big one in middle school, hygiene. <laughs> so uh, so if, they're, if they're lacking in doing any of that stuff and, and it's real hard to get them to do that, that might be a concern. You might want to think about going to the pediatrician. Um, and then resorting to unwell, unhealthy ways of coping with things. Um, unfortunately, some of our kids are cutting, um, doing drugs, uh, doing other risky behaviors that um, uh, could put their health at risk, obviously, um, because they're trying to find a way to cope with eating disorders, um, you know, and being in control of what's going into their bodies. And then, of course, anytime someone's thinking of hurting or killing themselves, that's obviously a red light. Um, and when, if you're in doubt, just reach out to, um, you know, you can reach out to your school counselor, or you can contact your pediatrician. Right now, they say that, like, um, what was it? Uh, I saw it on the news, like, last night, 50% of pediatric visits right now are for mental health. And that was from the American Academy of Pediatrics for Washington. And, um, and there are wait lists for it. So if you have concerns, get in, get early um, and see what resources your school might have. Sometimes they have counselors that have been assigned to their school from outside agencies to help. Yeah, that, I think that's just, that's really well said. Um, I'm, we're, I'm seeing the same thing with, with some of my fifth graders. I think what I noticed is um, with several hoods over their head, not wanting to turn the screen on, um, you know, talking with their parents about just how deeply sad they were. Um, you know, we were able to do some things, maybe set up some group activities so that they could, it was online, but they were able to collaborate and do some things together. Um, that did help. But a lot of the kids that were struggling were ones that, you know, because we have a lot of kids, there's that that digital divide, you know, for kids that even if we offer them Chromebooks, offer them hotspots, they don't, they don't have good internet. And so they're even more, um, you know, pulled away from everybody else. Um, I think the one 
bright thing I can add to that is we've only been back a week, but I can't tell you the joy I'm seeing in some of these kids who were so absolutely, they barely come to class when they did, they were depressed, their parents were worried, they come back, they are new kids. They're not, well, I think they're still struggling, but th they're so happy to be back. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to see, and, and you know, hopefully slowly more districts will be able to come back. But it's kind of been a, like a light at the end of the tunnel for some of these kids who have been able to come back and reconnect with their friends. Thank you all. I think you have all mentioned routine and the importance of routine. Uh, I wanna ask about the elephant in the room. Uh, we're transitioning, we're transitioning from all at home to back in school hybrid, as Deb mentioned, our own routines as parents and teachers are, every day looks different. How do we do this? How do we manage home routine for the hybrid experience or even when our work lives, uh, who's home with the kids or who's not home with the kids looks different every day? Hmm. That's a hard one. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it really is. There, there have been so many transitions and I, I mean, I it's, it's, it's a struggle. Um, I, I think the one thing, I hope this doesn't sound too idealistic, but I think a lot of our kids are learning a lot of really important life skills right now about how to um, how to work through this, you know, how to succeed in a really, really tough time. Um, I have, where's my, I have a little thing that I've shared with my kids and I don't know where I have it here. It used to be on my computer, but, um, you know, just that we struggle, we struggle, but that's going to, in the end, you know, maybe make us a stronger person. I don't, I don't think that really answers the question, but, um, I, I guess it still comes down to keeping routines and, it's hard. Right. It's, it's, I mean, being a parent, a lot of it is, um, is about having consistency and follow through the two hardest things with being a parent. Um, and, and maybe working into your routines, um, times when you sit and you, um, you acknowledge what are some of the positives that are coming out of this, or what are some positives in my day today? Kids need, everyone needs to have hope. And if you don't have hope for the future, then it's really hard to feel like, you know, what's the point in doing this day after day? It's the same thing over and over again. Um, finding the positives and reframing what the experience is about. Um, you know, I had to, instead of grieving that my child's not going to have a normal kindergarten experience, you know, I had to think, wow, I have the opportunity now to see something I would never have seen normally experience my child's learning I would never have been able to experience um, because I wouldn't have been in a classroom with her. I wouldn't have been seeing what's going on on her Zoom every day with her kindergarten teacher and the learning and interaction she's having and how she's growing. And so finding finding ways you can reframe some of the, the negative feelings that are going on right now can be really, really helpful. You know, a um, couple of words that we've been using a lot again along with consistency but i think for this year partly flexibility and adaptability are like the two big words for me personally and i think in our school too so and that's what really we've been telling our parents that every year yes there's structures you get up you get ready you go to work you go to school and a parent goes to work here and a parent goes there or a parent stays home while the kids are at school and that's all you literally put it in a box and you've shaken it all up it's, 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 a, it's puzzle pieces that aren't really being able to put together. That's how I look at it. And I think just being flexible and being adaptable and just kind of going with the every single day. I think that's one way to kind of deal with it. And I think that also partly teaches the kids to be resilient also that not every day right now for this year is not going to be the same. There are days where you'll be like, okay, what's what's the schedule for today? Apart from like your school schedule, 
But I think that's every day. It's kind of, you just take it literally one day at a time. I think that's what COVID has taught, at least how I look at it is that it has really taught me to take it one day at a time for right now. And that's kind of the way to just deal with it right now. I don't know, it's, it's a hard question, honestly. They are hard questions, I think. Um, here's another one. <laughs> um, what do you say to parents whose children aren't doing well, who, who are failing their classes? Um, is there gonna be an opportunity to get, to pull them back up? Um, do you think that um, there's going to be a way to bridge the gap between students who have thrived online and those who really haven't? Well, I don't know how much of a gap there's going to be because we're all kind of in the same <laughs> situation. Everybody's going to be to some degree behind um, from where they would normally have been probably if they were in online school. Um, so, but I think definitely kids are incredibly resilient. And I think uh, Deb, from what she's describing, uh, the joy of her kids coming back in, I think when um, our school isn't back in session, but when they do, I can see kids being so excited to be there that there might be a, a real energizing effect towards learning again for them, for some of them who were maybe more reluctant learners in the past. And in learning, um, the thing about learning is, is that um, kids need to talk about their learning with someone else. And um, that's what really cements it when they're able to do that small group work. It builds the connections, the synapses in their brain um, to really cement back into the classroom with that energy. If, you know, I'm sure teachers will be putting together great activities for them to really engage around learning. And, um, and I think they will all pull each other along. And I know we're really focusing on some of those kids who, um, who didn't, who weren't able to come to school, who didn't come to school and making sure that we've got some really strong interventions in there to help them really going back and looking at the basic skills in, in fifth grade of fifth grade and getting them the extra help they need um, so, that, so that they can you know, move forward. Um, so that was something that we've been very intentional about um, when we were you know, figuring out how we were going to structure fifth grade when we came back. Um, we actually even brought in a fourth, fifth grade teacher so that we could, um, well, we took one of our specialists and he, who had been a fourth grade, fifth grade teacher and brought him in. And so we were able to make our classes smaller, um, even than they needed to be in COVID and are really focusing on those kids who need those extra skills. And then we will continue to do small, small group with them. So, um, but it was hard. You know, there were a lot of kids who I felt like we, during that time, it was very sad. And I think our teachers have been kind of also talking about, you know, how to kind of help the students who have, who have been struggling. And as I mentioned before, that the other kids were really shining, you know, through the online um, sessions, they've been really helping too. Plus once they come back and that's exactly what our teachers are talking about is really give, you know, putting them in small groups and really focusing on those students at that time when they're in the classroom so they can kind of help up. And I truly believe that, you know, the other students too, there's so much, you know, they, there's such a support structure within the peers themselves that once they're all together, you know, under the same roof, I think just helping each other and building each other up with that support, whether it's social, emotional, or academic, I think it'll really help the other struggling students also come up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, here's a question from the audience. Um, someone says uh, being there to support for our children but have some concerns about it not being out about the academics right now what about our high schoolers where grades are important in order to go on to college the online learning is difficult and some grades are really suffering and those grades will be part of transcripts um, and this might be a that's the end of their question this might be a broader social issue in in coming times, I think, but I, I think that is an important question and um, our own expectations as parents for things to be out about academics. Maybe you could speak to those, to that. 
Well, I know a lot of the universities had passed on um, requiring some of the admissions tests that they had required in the past because they recognized that the situation we're in, um, it, it would be an unfair measure of a student's uh, academic performance to require them to take like an SAT or something like that for admissions and to um, put them up against other kids. Um, also, the uh, as far as grading, I would say if a student is struggling academics, I'm not sure. I think that's what the question was kind of about and, and that their grades are hurting because of that. They're getting more social emotional. Um, in classes, then um, reach out to the teacher and, and see because um, teachers always they're well they're usually welcome feedback. And if there's a concern about a grade or, or the student struggling, then um, I would reach out to them and just say, what can we do here to help support this student to get them kind of over that finish line and make sure that they have the strong transcripts that you know grade transcripts that you would want. But I would think universities and colleges um, would be looking at transcripts over the next couple of years with a bit of a, a lens of these kids were in a pandemic. <laughs> We've got to take that into as a factor in our admissions process. Yeah, I think being kind and being generous kind of would be the keywords for universities, I honestly feel right now, and I do hope they do that. And I feel with the younger kids, I, I feel like they are, um, it does seem like they're, I mean, there's concerns at all levels, but I think I hear more concern um, with the teachers and the kids at the, I, I think when you're, you know, fifth grade where I teach, there's a lot of time to get those grades up and, um, you know, we, we just need to make sure that we have those foundational skills there for them. But when you're at that age where, you know, it makes a big, you know, it, those grades count really count for what they're going to do. I think that's really hard. Thank you. How about for, and this I think could be true for students either staying 100% online in hybrid or returning to the classroom. After a year of being away from the classrooms, what can we do to motivate those students? Some parents are having a hard time getting them motivated. And what are some ideas that we can do? You mean motivated to come back into the classroom? I think motivated to be participative students. Yeah. In the classroom? Either in or online. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, I, I think as teachers, it's our job to, um, I mean, I know for me, I'm always finding ways to be more engaging, um, you know, to engage my students with um, make, make learning line. And so I think as a teacher, that's my goal is that learning continues to be meaningful and engaging. And I didn't stop doing anything that, that, you know, I usually do in my classroom. I just made it work online. And, you know, so hopefully um, it didn't work with everybody though. I mean, there's a lot of kids that didn't work with. And, and honestly, I have to say that it's seeing them back in school. That's what's really helped. And so I think that's the real question is if kids are going to stay online, what we can do, it, it's, it's really gotta be a partnership between teachers and parents. Yeah. We can't be in the, in the classroom. I can, I can work with my kids. I can, I can see where they're, you know, where they're right there. It's tangible. I can help them. I can't at home. Once that, once that screen is off, it's hard to help them. And so it's gotta be a partnership between parents and teachers. So and what, I, yeah, what yeah. are some things parents can do to, to motivate them, to motivate our kids? Well, I think it's back to that, keeping them on a routine, um, having consistent, consistent rules, boundaries. I mean, really, that's what you're going to have to do. Um, I mean, you know, jump in. I, I, I guess that's what I'm seeing is you just have to, you, you just, I mean, I, I've told a couple parents, it's, you know, they'll say my kids won't get up, they stay up all night, and I'll just say, but you're the parent, you, you can tell them, you know, you're the parent, and, you know, take away the Chromebook, tell them they need to go to bed, turn the lights off, it's easier for a fifth grade than, a, you know, high school, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's hard, it's hard. 
Yeah, and I agree, you know, I think as we, and as parents, I think this year is where we are struggling with boundaries as well with our kids, but I think it's even more so important than ever before that we be consistent, that you need to get up, you know, have an accountability. Your, your child needs to have that sense of accountability and responsibility. Yes, I am in school and I need to be doing this every day. That is my responsibility as a student, mm-hmm. you know, but also at the same time, really talking to your child, you know, if they're feeling that lack of motivation, you know, asking them to really think about what they're truly thinking. You know, when we talk about metacognition, really thinking about what you're truly thinking, you know, journal your thoughts, write them down, really think about, okay, what makes me really sad right now? So giving a chance, you know, to them to be able to express themselves in those ways, being kind, being gentle, but at the same time, being firm saying, you are a student and this is your responsibility, just like I wake up and I take care of you and the house or I work. That's my responsibility. Even there are days I don't want to do it, acknowledging that, but also saying, but you do need to get up and you do need to be doing this. Mm-hmm. I think there I has would, to be that balance. I would say for motivation, um, sometimes some of our kids need more extrinsic motivation than just intrinsic Um, I would first want to know from the teen, you know, what, what is it about your experience right now that is making you think, making you feel this way? Can, can they verbalize it? If they can't, then you've got to start the 100 questions of asking them, okay, so when you're online in your classroom, are you feeling still unmotivated? Are there times when you don't feel unmotivated? Because sometimes when you ask them about when they are feeling the opposite, it can give you clues as ways to motivate them. Um, Sometimes setting many goals and saying, you know what, if you, you, you do these things this week, um, we're going to have like a special, I don't know, family night or a little outing somewhere or something like that as some extrinsic type of rewards. Um, But, but yeah, if you can get out of the student, what is the barrier to them feeling like they want to participate? Is it that they need a real world connection to what they're learning? Is it that they don't see what the point of their schooling is? Um, Teachers often try to incorporate in their lessons, you know, how this is relevant to the real world. Um, But sometimes, you know, it's more difficult to do that with certain subjects than others. But, um, and then reach out to the teachers and say, I'm having a hard time with motivation. Um, And if you're able to um, talk to them about that and see sometimes teachers will have a totally different experience of a student in a classroom than what parents see sometimes. And that's usually more when we're in, in person learning. Um, but, um, but I, you know, I, I don't know. It depends on the student. <laughs> so. Thank you. I, I love those ideas and I love hearing the consistency of routine and, and maybe parents, I should remind you that where you will post this webinar as a recording um, on our YouTube channel so you can replay it for your kids and tell them the experts say there has to be routine. (laughs) But this next question, I want to shift a little bit to the anxiety that we carry um, as our children go back into the classroom on public transportation, buses, lunchroom, how do we handle our fears about potential exposure to the virus? And we don't want our anxiety to cause them anxiety. Is there anything that we can do? Uh, as, as our school uh, moved into hybrid, first we did it slow. You know, uh, our principal's motto was go slow to move fast. Um, but we started very slow. We brought kindergarten in first and then we brought in um, and then kindergarten, and then first through second, and then third through fifth started the other day. And um, parents were very key in how we came back. Um, we had a lot of teachers and how we were going to do our back to school plan. And I think if you're worried as a parent, you need to talk to your you need to talk to your school. Um, we've we, in, in our elementary, we were, they've been very strict on, um, and I, I feel, and I'm older, you know, I'm over 60. So, I mean, I was a little bit afraid, but, you know, the desks are six feet apart. We have fewer than 14 kids in the classroom at a time. Um, they wear masks the whole time. We don't do lunch. They come half a day and then the other 
the other group comes the other half of the day. Um, it's sanitized in between. I mean, there's just a lot of protocols that we are following. We worked very, um, very, very well with the with the health department and our administration. And so I think most schools are doing the same thing where they're really working hard to make sure that this is safe. Um, you know, the the buses are not are not very crowded. They've made sure. And um, but of course I'm in a small district, but I think that's I think that's why some districts haven't come back because they're really trying to make that work. They're trying to make it safe. So um, anyway, I, I think I think teachers are worried enough and administration are worried enough. They're going to make sure it's safe for all of our kids. I would say so we. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> we keep interrupting each other. We, we do that. We do that. <laughs> it's our thing. Um, I would say just attend informational meetings, get as much information as you can, because that helps. Because um, in lack of information, we kind of fill in things with, you know, fear sometimes. And um, so getting the facts about what it's going to be like for your child, what's it's going to look like going to the board meetings or the, or seeing whatever videos your schools posted about how they're bringing kids back in and what all the procedures are for getting lunches and getting on the buses and transitioning in the hallways and, and all of that. Um, my principals made videos of ours, we were going to have about 100 kids in what we call our e-hub. These are our kids who are at risk of um, not doing well, not, you know, not passing this year, we're bringing back a lot of kids who we have identified as struggling and um, they're set up six feet apart, spaced in the gym. Um, they have individual rooms to go to, to do their instruments for music. There's, there's daily cleaning of all of the desks of all of any like yoga mats that they're using for PE and their space. It's, it's pretty intense what the schools have been trying to put together for the safety of kids um, because nobody wants any child to um, to get sick or to take it home and have a loved one die um, because of this and so um, and then discussing you know just the personal safety with your student when they're getting ready to go back say I know you're excited to see your friends but you, you still got to maintain some boundaries and some personal distance and You've got your hand sanitizer and a couple masks shoved in your pack and <laughs> and um and that they're they're on board with making sure that they're gonna follow along with those guidelines mm -hmm. so we've been open in person for our preschool classes since september um and it's almost march right now and i can say i'm going to cross my fingers we've been doing really well uh, we've had three classes come in every single day and the excitement that I saw in September last year of kids actually being in person, I will never forget the first day of school. I've never seen such a day in my entire life of when I'm standing in the driveway of our school waiting for the cars to roll in and all the kids were super excited and you know our three year olds so it's three to six and they were all in mass, even the three year olds coming in mass every day they're their full day you know they come in at nine o'clock and they're going at three and some come at eight and stay till six for extended day and you know we our classes are being cleaned daily there's deep cleaning on all the high touch you know like the switches and the bathrooms and we have air purifiers in our classroom and before we started even school in september in august i did more than 10 webinars for the parents that were coming in person we had our safety slides and you know, we went into great detail about, you know, what exactly is happening, you know, the HEPA filters in the classroom, one window is constantly open, the kids are always washing their hands, you know, when they're having lunches, they're spread out in the classroom, and, uh, you know, it's the cleaning, just constant because even the material, in fact, in our schools that the kids are using, when they use the material, it doesn't go back on the shelves, it's actually going into a sanitizing area where the assistant is just kind of working with that. So, you know, once the parents see that, they're, they feel good, they feel calm, they know that we take care of our kids in the school. So it helps them feel also good about it. For that reminder that information is a, a good tool to battle anxiety and that we are all in this together. Thanks. Um, I have a specific question from one of our audience members. It's very specific. Um, and there might be a broader context too that you, you could add insight to. So here it is. I would like to see more small group activities now in full remote learning for my seventh grader. 
but the classes are all 25 minutes long and most of the synchronous time has been used to cover the content to get students ready to do their assignments while in classroom instruction. What will be solutions to create small group activities in a 25 minute long class? That is really hard. We, we're not running the 25 minute schedule. I know other schools are. Um, we're on 50 minute blocks. So our teachers have attempted to do small groups and put kids into small groups and breakout rooms with tasks and activities to engage in. However, unfortunately, um, a lot of times I hear that the kids still aren't talking to each other. They won't turn on the cameras. They won't engage with each other, um, especially our current seventh graders, because they're brand new to our building. Um, we didn't have them as sixth graders. They were in elementary. So, um, so they're already isolated, feeling like they don't know anybody. Teachers have been trying to do lots of social connections and things in the morning, but but we have been really, really struggling to get them to interact with each other in small group breakout sessions. Um, we're trying to offer more um, social, like after online schoolings over activities for kids to come and do fun things to hopefully try and get to know each other. But that I don't have a good answer for that because teachers have been trying and we're kind of kind of not sure how to move forward with that. Maybe Deb <laughs> did something great online with her kiddos. She, she has an idea for it. Um, we did the breakout rooms. We had 45 minute blocks uh, in fifth grade. We departmentalized. So I do all the English language arts and uh, the social studies. And then we have a math teacher. And we have a science teacher. And because we had 45 minute blocks, I was able to do breakout rooms. And but it's hard because you have to to get the kids to participate. You, you as a teacher need to go to each breakout room, you know, as so you pop in so that you know, and if, if there was one that, and I, I would kind of move the kids around so that I knew after I got to know the kids, you know, you had kids that would talk with the kids who wouldn't, but I saw the same thing. You know, if, if a student didn't want to talk, their camera was off and, and, you know, you try to get their cameras on and they would say that they, they were glitching so they couldn't. And <laughs> so it's, I, I, I had the same problem. It, it allowed us to do a little bit more small group, which was nice but it, it certainly wasn't um, optimal. Yeah, it's, I, I'll agree with Deb on this one. I have the exact same thing. So I'll just stay quiet on this one then. Thank you for answering the audience question. Um, here's another general one. I think um, a lot of us have felt this um, how do we keep up with the needs of our students, the technology needs when we don't have that experience ourselves? Um, are there strategies for us non-techie parents to help our kids? <laughs> Most of the kids know more than we do. Yeah. <laughs> They're helping me. Mrs. <laughs> Sherman, you need to, you need to do this. <laughs> so, um, but no, I get your question. Um, that last year when this happened, I was watching, I, I, was, I was crying at the beginning of the school year because I've got all these young colleagues that, you know, they just know tech and I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> help. Um, so it, it was, it was hard, but honestly, it was harder for me. The kids, the kids kind of have it down. And, you know, once I got it, I was able to kind of help them or I had colleagues helping me. Um, so it was your, I'm sorry, was your question about us having a hard time with the kids? I think it was about helping the parents to yeah, get yes. caught up on oh. the technology. I know we've posted, and I, I don't know if this is the type of technology they're asking about, but as far as like um, the technology that our kids are using, we've posted a lot of videos mm -hmm. um, our tech department has for parents to be able to access. Sometimes they're a little difficult to find in all the menus, but um, just to learn, you know, how to access this Canvas page and how to look at your child's, you know, um, whatever Ed Puzzle or Cami or whatever it is they're doing so that they can feel like they know a little bit more about it. I would say, you know, YouTube is your friend. Uh, go on, Google it. And there will be a video out there somewhere about whatever the technology is almost, yeah. you can be assured of that. Yes, it's, I, I'm more of a, I need to sit with someone and have one, someone show it to me versus mm -hmm. go read the manual or, you know, listen to the 20 minute long video. But, but um, sometimes we just have to put that time in and, and do, do the work <laughs> the hard way. Yeah. So 
I'm I'm a non-techie person. So for me, when I started Zoom, I was like, oh my God, I can't screen share. And I had 150 parents waiting for me to do this webinar. I'm like, oh my God, I had to ask my husband, how am I supposed to screen share? I don't know how to do this. But so what we did was we ended up creating a lot of videos at our school. A teacher helped, you know, she did all the, like the troubleshooting, what could possibly go wrong in a Zoom webinar. So she made like these little short videos, you know, that we sent to the parents if they have any questions and that really helped. And honestly, as Deb mentioned, it's the kids really that are teaching the parents and even us. Mm -hmm. I know my the four-year-olds that I read to in one of the classrooms, they'll help me sometimes. Like, Miss Nitty, we can't see your video. You need to press this, spin your video. I'm like, what? What do you want me to do? <laughs> so, you know, that's the kids have taught us, but we did end up creating a lot of videos for the parents who needed help. Thank you. I think can we all feel this way about all aspects of being a parent, but we feel we're doing the best. We want to do the best for our students. I think we might be feeling that we're doing the best that we can, but it feels like we're doing things wrong or not enough. How can we reassure ourselves that we are doing okay and helping our kids through this weird and different time in educate in their education I think the first thing honestly as a parent I know we are very hard on ourselves all the time so I think this is the year where we need to be kind to ourselves so that's what I'll say to you be kind to yourselves be forgiving of yourself it's okay you know, you have your child's best interest at heart and you are doing what you can to your best ability for your child already. And that's all you can do. So as I say, I'm gonna say it again, be kind to yourselves. That's really important. We are all, I think, trying to do the best we possibly can. And there's, and that's good enough. That is good enough. As long as you're there for your child and they can sit with you and you can, you know, reach out to them, they can talk to you, that is good enough. Just be kind and forgive yourself. It's okay. Yeah. Give yourself permission to, to not do it all <laughs> and say no, if you need to say no um, to other things people ask you to do. Um, really hard to do when you want to help and please other people. Um, but, but yeah. And if you're doing like six hours of homework a night with your child, then you need to contact the teacher and say, we can't do this. Can we, can we modify some things? Um, or just send the email and say, we couldn't finish the homework tonight. We needed, we needed a break. Can we have an extension? All of my teachers are giving, you know, that's just kind of absolutely. <laughs> we do what, what is best in, in, in the best interests of the students and the families, social, emotionally, we recognize we have kids taking care of younger siblings. You know, they're helping them get on their Zooms while their parents are at work and they're being parents at home too. And so um, if you need a break, then you take it. That comes first, your mental health. I think just asking that question, if you're, if a parent's asking that question of themselves, that just shows that you care and are doing the best you can. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Well, we don't have any other questions for our audience, from our audience. So I think uh, if you could each just kind of maybe wrap up and tell us, what do you as a teacher or a counselor or a director, what do you want parents to know as we go through surviving online and hybrid schooling? And what do you want students to know? I think right now, letting the parents, this is not for the parents, you know, I go back to always understanding what your child is going through, have them talk to you, make them write in a journal, and being mindful of what you're sharing, what kind of information you're sharing in front of your kids. You know, I think a big thing is exercising as a family together. I think that's a big one. It really helps, you know, you kind of build those uh, connections with your kids too. And then it kind of changes your mindset, being more positive and being more focused on everything else. And I keep going back to the be there for your kid. Just listen to them, acknowledge their feelings. It's, you know, academics, yes, plays a huge role. But I think this year we really need to acknowledge how everybody is feeling. 
I think that's really important, but also having, again, the, the boundaries and the consistency for your child. You know, that's important too, because accountability comes into play. For our students, and I talk to the kids at our school too, you know, again, acknowledge your feelings. And then sometimes we all go, ooh, negative emotions. Oh my gosh, don't be angry, don't be sad. I think those emotions are as important as being happy or you know, being content or being at peace because we need to be able to express those emotions as anger and sadness and frustration. And the ability to be honest about your own emotions and letting them come out and just being with them, I think that's really important because shoving them down is not healthy. So letting them out in a healthy way for students, I think that's really important. And I think as teachers, we can tell them we are here for you not as just a student, as a human being, and that we truly celebrate you as an individual and who you are and just appreciating them. I think that's really the key here. Yeah, I would say that um, teachers are open to ideas from parents and from kids. So if there are ways that you think or you see that you could help um, or your student has ideas for how um, to help with engagement in the classroom or something fun to be added in, um, suggest it to the teacher. Um, we are doing constant different ways of checking in with kids social emotionally and, um, and trying to monitor that and then go and follow up with those kids who are filling out these various surveys we're doing and, and um, trying to address that. But, um, and incorporate social emotional learning into the lessons as well. But, um, but if you have suggestions, reach out and let, let your school know, because um, if something isn't working or it's going poorly or whatever, don't just be silent about it. <laughs> let, us, let us know. Um, and, and hopefully we can come up with ways to, to change that. Um, and then, yeah, if you ever have any concern about your student and, and their mental health or worries, then reach out and talk to your school counselor or contact your pediatrician um, because it's better, always better safe than sorry. Yeah, I really agree with that. We've made a lot of changes based on what kids and parents have, um, have contributed to us for things that do or don't work. And they've been, they've been great. But I think the one thing I would want to leave with is just that, you know, there's no place I'd rather be than in the classroom. And these kids really become part of our life. They're, you know, they, they're our, fam they're our school family for a year and we're going to do everything possible to make this work for them. And um, I, I honestly think for me, this has made me a better teacher. It really has. I've had to be much more intentional about what I do. And so I think um, a lot of us, in, in talking to my colleagues, a lot of us feel that way. We become better teachers. And I think that, you know, because of that, we're going to be able to meet the needs of our kids. And you know what? I don't think there's going to be snow days anymore because we all know how to teach online. So no more snow days. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah, I know the poor kids, we want snow days. But no, I, I, I think that if we have to find the silver lining that um, in, a, in a very difficult time, I think that um, this is going to make us better teachers. I agree. I think our communities as, as you know, the parents, the, the students and the teachers and the administrators, I think we've all come together mm -hmm. in so many ways that I don't think we ever could have before to just kind of support and lift each other through all of this. Right. Oh, thank you all. You've left me with a smile. I'm thinking about um, this and I, I think I'm going to revisit routine with my own kids. <laughs> Um, and also um, write, write some thank you notes to the teachers in our school district who are working so hard, teachers and counselors and administrators. Thank you all. And to our audience, we hope you've enjoyed this evening's program and have gained valuable information for you and your family. To learn more about Issues That Matter, we have snowisle.org slash Issues That Matter, a site that shows all of our past and upcoming programs. In fact, our next events will cover caregiving under pandemic pressure, and those will take place on March 11th and March 13th. Um, and also, in addition to thanking our panelists tonight, we want to thank the following organizations for their support of issues that matter. We would like to th thank Snohomish County Behavioral Health Services and the Island County Human Services. They have helped guide our topic selection 
for this series. And we would also like to thank Snow Owl Libraries Foundation. Thank you all and have a great evening. <laughs>